Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at The Organic View, or you can contact me directly at June Stoyer. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. On today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming back Dr. Virginia Messina, who is a beloved authority on plant-based diets and the author of several best-selling books, including her latest book, Vegan for Her, The Women's Guide to Being Healthy and Fit on a Plant-Based Diet. So I would like to welcome back to the show, Dr. Virginia Messina. Good afternoon, Dr. Messina, and welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be here, Joan. Your book has come at such a perfect time. I just want to say thank you personally for writing it. There are so many people that have questions about plant-based diets, and unfortunately, there's been a lot of false information that's circulating in social media and just in general, and hopefully we can solve some of those little mysteries and explain to people what it's really about. But before we begin, can you share with our audience a little bit about yourself and why you decided to write Vegan for Her? Well, I'm a, I'm a dietitian and I'm also a public health nutritionist. I uh, got my degree in public health from the University of Michigan several decades ago. And I have been a vegan myself for a long time, um, primarily for ethical reasons. It's been an important part of my life. And as I became more involved in veganism from a professional standpoint, I saw a, a lot of the things that you were just talking about, the fact that there's so much misinformation about how to meet nutrient needs on vegan diets, whether you can meet nutrient needs on vegan diets. Some people believe that you can't. And I wanted to correct that information and give people um, uh, very basic pieces of information that they need to be healthy on a vegan diet and to feel confident on a vegan diet. Thank you. Can you share with our audience exactly why it's beneficial to follow a plant-based diet as opposed to consuming meat and other animal products? Well, from a personal health standpoint, um, there are so many benefits. Every, every step we take towards eating more plant foods and fewer animal products can help to reduce your blood pressure, help to reduce blood cholesterol levels, um, perhaps reduce your risk for getting cancer. There are so many compounds in plant foods, uh, fruits and vegetables especially, but also beans and whole grains and nuts and seeds that have antioxidant activity, um, other kinds of health perfective effects. And those, those kinds of effects are not found in animal foods or are found in animal foods at, at much lower levels. And then of course, there is the whole issue of the things in animal foods that we want to avoid. Um, things like saturated fat, cholesterol, um, other compounds that have oxidative, uh, oxidative impacts on the body that can raise risk for disease, raise inflammation. So every step we take to, to switch out animal foods for plant foods is bound to, um, to improve your health in some way, lower your risk for chronic disease. Thank you. Can you explain to our audience what the plant plate is and exactly how can people use this to guide their own diets and make sure that they get the basic nutrients that they need? And vitamins. Well, the, the plant plate is is my is my new vegan guide for um, uh, for healthy meal planning for vegans, and it's it's uh, published in my book Vegan for Her, which is a book for vegan women, of course. But it's really applicable to everyone. Men can use it, and children can use it. It's it's good for everybody. It it um, gives recommendations for uh, consuming enough whole grains and legumes, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds with reminders to make sure that you're getting vitamin D, vitamin B12, a little bit of iodized salt for iodine, 
and um, including healthy fats in your diet. And I think that one of the most unique aspects of the plate and something that I really worked hard on trying to convey is the fact that calcium rich foods are placed on the rim of the plate because I wanted to show that um, that these that each of the different food groups, grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, includes foods that are good sources of calcium. And so I wanted people to see that calcium is found in all of those food groups. We don't have to lump it just into one group, dairy alternatives. We can find it anywhere. And so I wanted to portray the idea that calcium is important, but that um, you don't have to consume any one particular food. You can get it from all kinds of foods throughout the plant plate. Do you have an, any intentions of submitting this to the USDA for incorporation into the school systems programs? Because uh, right now all they have is this antiquated pyramid that really just needs to go. Yeah. Well, they're actually using a plate now as well. They're using a plate. Excellent. Plate, but it does, doesn't look anything like mine, of course, as, as you know, because it has a whole group dedicated yeah. to dairy foods and another whole group dedicated to protein foods, which does include legumes and nuts, but is pretty heavy on meat. Um, I don't think that uh, I don't think that the U.S. government is going to be very interested in my <laughs> because it doesn't contain any animal foods and they're not about to promote a vegan diet. But I wish that they would that they would adopt some more um, something that that took some elements from my plant plate. For it. at the very least, I wish that they would acknowledge that calcium-rich foods are in all of the food groups instead of just having a milk group. I think that that would be a huge step. They wouldn't even have to tell people not to drink milk. It would just it would just be great if they would let them know that there are lots of alternatives to drinking milk. If there are any mothers out there that would like to have their school system adopt this, what would you recommend? Um, I would recommend that they speak to um, whatever that they, they speak to the people in the in the school's cafeteria or whatever committee is in charge of making choices about foods and show them the plant plate. It's really pretty. Um, it's it's really very attractive, and I think that kids would like it. And I think that it could help to give um, you know to give schools a little bit of even if it wasn't exactly right for them. It might help to give them a little bit of different perspective and they might might um, be educated about some of the, the sources of some of these nutrients. I've already heard from um, parents who are homeschooling who want to use it because mm -hmm. most of the materials that they're getting in their science curriculums on nutrition are emphasizing meat and dairy foods. So for people who do have that option, um, the plant plate can be a great, a great way to take, teach kids about healthy eating. Thank you. I find it very interesting that we don't consume as many nuts and beans as we should. Why is that? Well, I think, you know, there are a couple of reasons. I think that people don't consume beans simply because they didn't grow up eating them. I didn't, you know, when I was growing up, we had beans and, and baked beans on the 4th of July. And once in a while, my, my grandmother made lentil soup. And those were the only two times I ever saw beans. And, and I didn't mm -hmm. eat them. I didn't, I didn't like them as a kid. And so in, in many cultures within, within North America, um, beans are just not common. People don't know what to do with them. They don't think that they like them. So I think that introducing beans, really good bean-based recipes and dishes to people, showing them how delicious beans can be, is some great vegan outreach. Um, because beans are so important in vegan diets. They're a great way to get protein. They're a great alternative to, to eating animal products. And I think that many people avoid nuts because they're high in fat. And uh, we've kind of gotten into this, this uh, idea that we're supposed to avoid all high-fat foods that are bad for us. And that's a very outdated approach to nutrition. Nobody in the nutrition community really in, is talking about um, eating a low-fat diet any longer. What we're talking about is choosing healthy fats. And nuts are really healthy fats. They're really good for reducing heart disease risk, for example. So I think the more that people learn about these foods, hopefully the more they'll eat them. I agree. You also bring up avocados. Can you share with our audience that 
may not be too crazy about avocados, why they should perhaps reconsider incorporating avocados into their meals. Yeah, they're such a healthy food. They're, um, they are rich in, in healthy fats, monounsaturated fats. They're packed with fiber and they have vitamin E and folic acid. They're really nutritious food. Um, and you know, we tend to use, we tend to use avocado condiment style. So if you're worried about the calories in them, you don't really need to, you're just going to, you know, make them into a little bit of guacamole with some, um, salsa or tomatoes in it and, and have maybe a quarter of a cup on top of a burrito. And, and that's a, a nice small serving of, of avocado. That's not going to overload your plate with fat. That's going to give you a little bit of healthy fat and, and some good nutrition. And they're so good. They taste so good. Most and so. Uh, yeah, and avocados are tremendous as far as their diversity. I've seen so many recipe recipes which incorporate the avocado with dark chocolate. Yeah. And so many desserts. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I saw that on Pinterest the other day. A, a, a chocolate. Um, I well, I saw a chocolate cupcake with avocado icing, and uh, thought that that was really pretty interesting. Maybe not I the think obvious way to get avocado, but try. <laughs> I think the more that people learn that food is something that they can play with, that they can mix the ingredients up in ways that are not conventional, I think they'll find the more they will embrace incorporating these ingredients into different recipes, and they'll find a whole new, I, I guess, myriad of recipes that they can work with instead of the same old thing night after night. Right. Yeah, and it's just a matter of exploration and, you know, try and, you know, trying some things out, trying new fruits and vegetables. And if you find one that you don't like, you know, if you try something new and you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. We don't have to eat every single food that's available to us. But experimenting is a great way to broaden your, your culinary horizons a little bit. It's really fun. Thank you. Can we talk about protein? One of the biggest complaints that I hear about is, well, if you make the transition to a plant-based diet, you're not going to consume enough protein because you're eliminating the meat from the diet. Can you explain what vegan diets consist of as far as incorporating the, the protein? And also, can you put some emphasis on tofu, one of my favorite subjects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of my favorite subjects too, and it's also one of my favorite foods. Um, all, almost all plant foods, all grains, legumes, vegetables, nuts, and seeds contain protein. And for the most part, vegans who are meeting their calorie needs, eating a variety of foods, they're not going to have any problems getting enough protein. I do encourage vegans to pay particular attention to including legumes in their diet because legumes are a good source of the essential amino acid lysine. And lysine is an amino acid that can fall a little bit short in vegan diets if you're not eating legumes. Um, I'd like to remind people that legumes are not just beans. We just talked about how wonderful beans are, but um, some people are still making that transition to including those foods in their diets. So um, it's, it's good to look at the, the broad range of foods that fit into the group of legumes. It also includes peanuts and peanut butter. And most people like peanut butter. If you have a peanut butter sandwich once a day, um, that's going to give your, your vegan diet a big, a big boost of protein. I recommend uh, three servings per day of legumes, um, peanuts, dry beans, or any kind of soy foods. I generally get my, my three servings by eating um, a little bit of peanut butter at lunch, um, some kind of black beans or lentils at dinner, and I have scrambled tofu for breakfast every single day because I love tofu, and um, and I think it's really good for you. What kind of scrambled tofu do you make? Do you use the extra firm, the soft? What do you use? I use the extra firm, and, um, and sometimes I press it. If I'm feeling kind of lazy or in a little bit of a hurry, I don't even bother pressing it. And I just saute it in a tiny bit of olive oil, um, add some, uh, a little bit of nutritional yeast sometimes, or um, sometimes not. I might just season it with some herbs, but it's really, it's really one of my favorite foods. It just makes me uh, feel like I've started my day in a really healthy way when I have tofu for breakfast because it is so packed with protein and it has um, isoflavones, which has some health benefits. 
Um, and it's just, uh, it, it's kind of, it's kind of a, it's a, has a hearty, meaty kind of a texture. And I guess maybe that's something that I miss at breakfast time. So tofu really fills the bill for me. For people that are just starting out, could you share with them what you mean by pressing the tofu? Well, you can buy, a, well, pressing the, to, pressing the tofu, tofu, of course, is very porous. And you know when you take it out of the package that it kind of drips water. There's water inside of the tofu. So you can use a tofu press, an actual little appliance that you can buy. You put the tofu in and you press it and let it sit like that in the refrigerator for an hour or so. And it presses the water out of it. Um, and then when you cut the tofu up into cubes or into to little tofu steaks, and marinate it or cook it with some different flavors, it absorbs those flavors much better once all that water has been squeezed out of it. I don't have a tofu press, so I wrap my tofu in paper towels, put it on a cookie sheet, and put a cutting board on top of it with a pot of water on top of that. I do it, it's the old school way of, of pressing <laughs> tofu, and it works just as well, and it's really cheap. Um, so that's how I press my tofu. Thank you. I think one of the biggest problems new vegans have is they don't know what to do with tofu. That was one of the biggest problems that I had. And once I learned that, yeah, by the way, if you get rid of that water, it does absorb right. flavor. And one of the more recent discoveries for me has been the utilization of buffalo sauce in whatever capacity. And the hotter, the better. And I found that I was craving some of the uh, the buffalo wings and whatnot, but I'm not about to go back and eating chicken, of course. And I found that the addition of the sauce on the tofu was absolutely fantastic. And now it's something that I, I would even eat for breakfast. So it's interesting that you talk about adding spices and uh, different seasonings to the tofu for breakfast. Yeah, that is, and that is absolutely the beauty of tofu, the fact that it is, it's fairly bland and it's very porous. And so whatever you cook it with, it's going to take up that flavor. And so you can have it for breakfast or, or for an appetizer with the spicy, spicy, spicy buffalo sauce, or you can mix it with chocolate and sweetener and, and make a, make a pudding. And I think that that shows how versatile Tofu. Mm. So it, can, it can go in absolutely any direction you want it to. How much tofu should a woman consume a day? Well, generally, we you know we look towards Asian populations to see um, because they've been eating tofu and and other um, soy products like miso and tempeh and soy milk for hundreds of years, and these foods are very important parts of their diet. So we can look to see what they do to get a little bit of guidance about what's a reasonable amount of these foods to eat. And in Japan, where intake has been discovered the most, um, has been studied the most, average tofu intake is about one and a half servings per day, one to two servings per day for most people. Older people who eat more traditional type diets, eat the diets that they were eating 50 years ago, tend to have a little bit higher um, uh, intake of soy foods. They eat more like three servings per day. So I say that anything between one and three servings per day is reasonable. Um, I tend to eat one to two servings per day because I like, I like to eat a variety of foods and, and that's just how, um, how soy products fit into my diet. I have tofu for breakfast and then I might have um, tempeh for dinner or some kind of a soy yogurt with fruit in it or in the afternoon. So generally I have a second serving of soy during the day. In regards to women's hormones, does soy impact or the consumption of soy products, including tofu, have an impact on women's hormones? Well, no, uh, the, the compounds in tofu that are um, hormone-like are called isoflavones. They don't impact women's hormones. They are not the same as women's hormones. And the reason for that is that um, the isoflavones are selective in the kinds of tissues they um, bond in and affect. They, there are receptors within those tissues for 
estrogen, the hormone, and for isoflavones. And estrogen is not picky. It will bond to any of those receptors. And so no matter what tissue it's in, it acts like estrogen. It has its hormone actions. Um, isoflavones are more picky. They don't respond to all of those receptors. And so in some tissues where estrogen has an effect, isoflavones have no effect. In some of those tissues, they actually have an opposite effect. So for example, in areas where estrogen might have harmful effects, for example, in raising risk for endometrial cancer, isoflavones from soy foods don't have any effect. In areas where estrogen has some positive beneficial effects, like its effects on bones, estrogen helps to build strong bones. Again, isoflavones don't appear to have any effect. They're not protective, they're not beneficial, they're not harmful, they're just basically don't have any effect at all. But when we look at things like breast cancer, it's a little more interesting because isoflavones seem to have some protective effects. And they have protective effects basically at two, at two times in a woman's life in particular. Um, when young girls um, during puberty and menarche, when they're first starting to get their period, when they eat soy foods during that time period, it appears to give them a lifelong lower risk for developing breast cancer. There's something about those isoflavones that are protective at the time of breast development. And the other time that we see protection is in women who have had breast cancer. Women who have been treated for breast cancer who regularly eat soy foods appear to be at lower risk at a better prognosis and a lower risk for recurrence of their breast cancer. So um, what we see with isoflavones is that they are not the same as estrogen. They have different effects in different parts of the bodies, even though those, even though those effects are sometimes estrogen-like. Thank you. Can you also share with our audience some of the other myths about the vegan diet that have been running rampant throughout the internet and just in general because there's so many people that say well when you're only consuming a plant-based diet there's so many negative effects as far as a woman's health can you just share some of the more common ones that you've addressed well I think that one of the big one of the big issues for women um, eating vegan diets one of the things that they worry about is getting enough calcium um, because we are so used to getting calcium from one food or one food group, and that's dairy food. And, and so we've been kind of duped into thinking that that's the only way to get calcium or the easiest or best way that somehow that calcium is better than, than other calcium. Um, that's good marketing. It's not good science. Because calcium is calcium, no matter where you get it, and it is found in a variety of foods. It's found in certain leafy green vegetables like collards and kale and mustard greens and bok choy, Chinese cabbage. And it's found in almonds and almond butter, navel oranges, and um, calcium set tofu has calcium. And certainly fortified plant milks and fortified juices provide lots of calcium. So um, we see actually two kinds of myths in this area. There, there's one that says that vegan women don't need to worry about getting enough calcium, that that's not really an issue for us. And that is a myth, that is not true. We do need to get adequate calcium, just like anybody eating any other kind of diet. The second myth is that it's hard to get it from plant foods, and that's not true either. It's perfectly easy to get it from plant foods. You just have to identify a few that you enjoy eating and make sure that you eat them regularly. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's something that we really, really need to educate the more mainstream nutrition community about the fact that calcium is not cow's milk. Um, calcium is a nutrient that's found in a lot of different kinds of foods. When it comes to supplements, what do you recommend? Because I know that one of the biggest push or one of the, one of the biggest supplements out there that is being pushed is fish oil. And for many of us, that's just not happening. Right. That's not happening for me. And that's not happening for, <laughs> for other vegans. Um, and there are lots of, uh, you know, aside from the fact that taking fish oils is obviously not vegan, it's also an industry that is not at all sustainable. And um, so I think we really want to discourage people from using fish oil supplements. For the, the fish oil supplements provide um, two long chain omega-3 fats, DHA and EPA. And that's what people are after because there's some 
evidence that those fats reduce inflammation, that they reduce risk for heart disease, for Alzheimer's disease. Those are all ongoing areas of, of research. We don't have very good answers in those areas um, about whether those supplements are really helpful at all or whether they're just a waste of money. But for people who want to take those, take DHA and EPA, we can go straight to the source and get it the same way that the fish get it. They get it from microalgae. And we can take supplements that provide microalgae um, sourced DHA and EPA. And that's vegan and it's the exact same fat, just as effective, raises blood levels of the fat. So there's no reason to, to avoid these um, in favor of fish oil supplements. And taking the algae-derived supplements is actually so much more sustainable, so much more compassionate. Um, so it's a really good choice. And, um, uh, and you asked about supplements in general. The other supplements that I recommend are, of course, vitamin B12. All vegans need to take vitamin B12 supplements or use a uh, consume a food that's fortified with vitamin B12. That's so important. We don't get it any other way. And it's also important to make sure that the type of B12 supplement you're taking is cyan cyanocobalamin because that's the one that's been best studied and there are concerns about other types like methylcobalamin that they may not be stable enough to really give us enough of the vitamin. And then I recommend for people who aren't getting adequate sun exposure, I live in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we get sun exposure about uh, 30 days a year. And um, <laughs> so I'm not making a whole, and I'm not making a whole lot of, of vitamin D. I'm also over 50, I'm well over 50, which means that my skin doesn't make vitamin D as well as it did when I- And you look gorgeous. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm almost 60 actually. And, um, See, folks, what a vegan diet can do for you. <laughs> and, it's, and vitamin D supplements are a part of that. They're good for your skin, and they're good for keeping, keeping bones healthy and brain healthy. So if you're not absolutely certain that you're getting adequate sun exposure, um, be sure that you're taking a vitamin D supplement about 600 international units per day. And it can be D2 or D3. It doesn't matter. D2 is the vegan type of vitamin D. Thank you so much. Dr. Messina, do you think that you're going to write a book called Vegan for Him? Everybody's asking. I was. I had no intention of doing that because, of course, I'm not a him, and, and so I thought it might be nice. But you are an authority. Yeah, I, uh, and I could find a him to, to write that with me, I'm sure. Everybody's been asking about it, and uh, I had no intention of doing so, but there seems to be so much interest in it that um, I think it would be kind of fun. There are some great topics to talk about for guys related to plant-based diets and vegan diets. So it would be a fun book to write. It's a much needed book for you to write. So <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to reading that. And I know that at some point you will do something because you're just fabulous. And that's why people love you. Uh, can you share with our audience your website? And do you have any upcoming book signings or any book tours that you'd like to share also? Um, my website is theveganrd.com. And I also have a website uh, with my co-author, JL Fields. We have a website for the book, which is veganforher.com. And we have a forum on there. We have a discussion forum for talking about all kinds of different issues. And we even have some guys in the forums who want to talk about stuff. And that's great. We're happy to have them there. Um, I will be, my next um, uh, speaking engagement is not until the end of October. It's at the Boston Vegetarian Food Festival. And I'll be there for two days. Um, speaking twice and signing books and just chatting with people I know from social media. That's always fun to meet the people that I only know over the internet. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much. It has been wonderful having you on the show and I really do hope that you come back again, not, not too long from now, but uh, in the near future. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you so much too. You're very welcome. And folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.